As a lifeguard, you need to follow standard precautions to protect yourself while providing care. At times, you may come in contact with blood and other potentially infectious material such as other body fluids that may contain blood-borne pathogens. Blood-borne pathogens can cause disease. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV are three diseases that are passed through body fluids that are of primary concern for lifeguards. Anyone's blood or body fluids might carry disease-causing germs. Someone you know well or even someone who shows no obvious signs or symptoms could be infected. Following standard precautions, you should treat all blood and body fluids as potentially infectious material. By following standard precautions, you can minimize the spread of infection while providing emergency care. Standard precautions include the use of personal protective equipment, good hand hygiene, engineering controls, work practice controls and proper equipment cleaning, and spill cleanup procedures. When exposure to any potential infectious material might occur, it's important to use personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment includes nitrile latex-free disposable gloves, breathing barriers, protective eyewear, and any other specialized protective clothing that will keep you from directly contacting infected materials. Wear nitrile latex-free disposable gloves when providing care. In addition to disposable gloves, wear protective coverings such as a mask, eyewear, and gown when there is a likelihood of contacting blood or other potentially infectious material that may splash. When giving ventilations to a victim, use a CPR breathing barrier or bag valve mask resuscitator. After providing care, follow proper procedures to dispose of soiled equipment and clean up any blood or potentially infectious material that may have contaminated the area. Take the same precautions in disposal and cleanup as you do when treating the victim. Any time you might come in contact with body fluids, you need to take deliberate action to prevent the spread of infectious disease. A blood spill kit should be available to safely clean up blood. Follow the procedures outlined in your facility's exposure control plan. When removing gloves, be careful not to touch your bare skin to the outside of either glove. First, pinch the palm side of one glove near the wrist and pull the glove off so that it is inside out. Holding the glove in the palm of your gloved hand, slip two fingers under the wrist of the glove, pull the glove off inside out so that the first glove you removed is inside it. Dispose your soiled gloves in a biohazard bag and wash your hands. Proper hand washing is the most effective method of preventing the spread of infection. To properly wash your hands, thoroughly scrub them with soap and warm water for at least 15 seconds, giving added attention to fingernails and jewelry. Standard precautions are simple to remember. Always use personal protective equipment when caring for a victim or cleaning up a scene when any body fluid is involved. Properly dispose of your personal protective equipment and follow proper procedures to clean up after providing care. If you don't protect yourself on the job, you can't protect the people that count on you. As a lifeguard, victim assessment is an important part of your job. Proper assessment can increase the victim's chance of survival. Following the scene size up, conduct a primary assessment to determine if the victim has any life-threatening conditions, and if so, summon EMS personnel if a call has not already been made. Size up the scene while forming an initial impression before providing care. Your assessment of the scene may change how you decide to respond. To size up the scene, use your senses to check for hazards that could present a danger to you or the victim. Use appropriate PPE. Determine the number of injured or ill victims. Determine what caused the injury or the nature of the illness. Look for clues to what may have caused the emergency and how the victim became ill or injured. Form an initial impression that may indicate a life-threatening emergency. Does the victim look sick? Is the victim awake and moving? Is the victim unresponsive? Is the victim bleeding severely? Is the victim's skin color abnormal? Lastly, determine what additional resources may be needed. If you see severe life-threatening bleeding, use any available resources to control the bleeding, including a tourniquet if one is available and you are trained. When checking the victim for responsiveness, if the victim appears unresponsive, shout, Are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Use the person's name if you know it. Then tap the victim on the shoulder and shout, Are you okay? again in a shout-tap-shout -shout sequence. Are you okay? He's unresponsive. Call 911. Get me an AED. 
A response may be subtle, such as some slight movement or momentary eye-opening that occurs when you speak to the victim or apply a stimulus, such as a tap to the shoulder. If a child or infant appears to be unresponsive, obtain consent from a parent or guardian if possible before providing care. When checking for responsiveness on an infant, follow the same shout-tap-shout -shout sequence, but tap the infant's foot to see if they respond. Baby. Baby, baby. You call 911, I have an unresponsive infant, I need an AED. If the victim is not awake, alert, and oriented, or does not respond, call EMS if you have not already done so. Call 911, he's unresponsive, get me an AED. If the victim is responsive, obtain consent. If the victim does not respond, open the airway. Check for breathing and a pulse for at least 5 seconds, but no more than 10 seconds. With your ear over the victim's mouth and nose, listen and feel for breathing, and look for the chest to clearly rise and fall. For an adult or child, feel for a carotid pulse by placing two fingers in the middle of the victim's throat. Slide them into the groove at the side of their neck and press lightly. For an infant, feel for the brachial pulse on the inside of the upper arm between the infant's elbow and shoulder and press lightly. Breathing and pulse should be checked simultaneously. After completing a breathing and pulse check, provide care as appropriate. If a victim is unresponsive and not breathing as a result of a drowning, give the victim two ventilations. Now that we understand how to perform a primary assessment, let's look at the three ways to open the airway. The most common method is from the side of the victim using the head tilt chin lift technique. Place one hand on the forehead and two fingers on the bony part of the chin. Then tilt the head back as you lift up on the chin, taking care to avoid pressing on the soft tissue under the chin. To open the airway from above the victim's head, use the jaw thrust maneuver with head extension. Place your thumbs and fingers on each side of the victim's face, making sure your fingers are behind the angles of the jawbone. Tilt the head back while lifting the jaw to open the airway. If you suspect injury to the head, neck, or spine, use the jaw thrust maneuver without head extension. Use the same hand placement, but lift the jaw without tilting the head back. When giving ventilations, each ventilation should last about one second and make the chest clearly rise. Pause briefly between ventilations to let the exhaled air escape. If the chest does not rise with any ventilation attempt, retilt the victim's head and reattempt ventilations. You should always use an appropriately sized resuscitation mask when giving ventilations. If at any time an unresponsive person vomits, the airway could become blocked. Roll the victim toward you onto their side and wait for the vomiting to stop. Then use a finger sweep to clear out the mouth. Once the mouth is clear, continue to provide care based on the conditions you find. If you determine the unresponsive person is breathing, take note of the quality of respirations. Normal, effective breathing is quiet, regular, and effortless. However, Isolated or infrequent gasping with the absence of other breathing may be agonal breaths, which can occur even after the heart has stopped beating. Do not confuse this with effective breathing. Care for the victim as if there is no breathing at all. If a victim is unresponsive but breathing and you do not suspect a head, neck, or spinal injury, Place the victim in a side-lying recovery position. To place the victim in a recovery position, raise the victim's arm that is closest to you and roll the victim toward you so that their head rests on their extended arm. Bend the victim's knees to stabilize their body. A recovery position should also be used whenever you are alone and need to leave the scene, such as to summon EMS. When a victim is in respiratory arrest, not breathing but has a pulse, give ventilations in cycles using a resuscitation mask. Remember, 
the two most common positions are to the side of the victim's head or above the victim's head. Now, practice giving a series of ventilations as you would for an unresponsive adult who is not breathing but has a pulse. Ready? Go. In a real emergency, you would continue giving ventilations for about two minutes, then remove the mask and check for breathing and a pulse simultaneously for at least five seconds, but no more than 10 seconds. Continue giving ventilations if necessary. Common complications of a drowning incident include frothing or vomiting. If you see froth, open the airway and begin to continue giving ventilations. If the victim vomits, Clear the airway before giving or continuing ventilations. You will learn how to clear a victim's airway later in this course. When giving ventilations for a child or an infant, the rate changes to one ventilation about every three seconds. Two rescuers should operate a bag valve mask resuscitator or BVM. One maintains the airway and seals the mask attached to the BVM, while the other delivers ventilations by squeezing the bag. Select the correct mask size and assemble the BVM. When positioning and sealing the mask, rescuers should use the technique that helps create the best seal. This technique may be influenced by variables such as the rescuer's hand size, but it is recommended that rescuers use the EC hand position. To use the EC hand position, Place both hands around the mask, forming an E with the last three fingers on each hand, and a C with the thumb and index fingers around both sides of the mask. Seal the mask completely around the victim's mouth and nose, and maintain an open airway. As the second rescuer squeezes the bag to give ventilations, watch for the victim's chest to rise and fall to determine if the ventilations are effective. Ventilating too fast or with too much volume can be dangerous. Ventilation rates vary with the age of the victim. Give one ventilation about every 5 to 6 seconds for an adult, or about 10 to 12 ventilations per minute, and one ventilation about every 3 seconds for a child or an infant, or about 12 to 20 ventilations per minute. CPR is an essential life-saving skill that keeps blood containing oxygen circulating to the brain and other vital organs. Knowing how to correctly perform CPR will help you provide appropriate and effective care until more advanced medical personnel take over. After the primary assessment, perform CPR if an unresponsive victim is not breathing and does not have a pulse. It is important to minimize interruptions of chest compressions when performing CPR. First, ensure the victim is on a firm, flat surface. Expose the victim's chest to ensure proper hand placement and the ability to visualize chest recoil. Give 30 chest compressions. Practice giving effective chest compressions. Position yourself next to the victim's upper chest with your knees about shoulder width apart, your gloves on, and a resuscitation mask assembled. Place the heel of one hand in the center of the chest on the lower half of the victim's sternum. Only the heel of your hand should touch the chest. Place your other hand on top and lace your fingers together, which helps to keep your fingers off the chest. Keep your arms as straight as possible and shoulders directly over your hands. Locking your elbows will help you keep your arms straight. You are now in the correct position to give chest compressions. Ready? Go! For an adult, compress the chest at least 2 inches deep but no more than 2.4 inches. Be sure to give smooth compressions and allow the chest to fully recoil between each compression to allow blood to flow back into the heart following the compression. Okay, stop. Next, 
Practice cycles of 30 chest compressions with two ventilations. Be sure to establish a seal and open the airway. The compressions should be at a rate of at least 100 per minute, but no more than 120 per minute, letting the chest recoil between each compression. Count out loud to help keep an even pace. Try to minimize interruptions to chest compressions after you provide ventilations. Get into position. Place your hands on the center of the chest, fingers laced and up. Ready? Go! 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 7, 28, 29, 30. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve and thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. One rescuer CPR for a child is essentially the same as CPR for an adult, with slight modifications. Compress a child's chest only about 2 inches deep. The ratio of compressions to ventilations when performing one rescuer CPR for a child is the same as it is for an adult. 30 chest compressions followed by 2 ventilations. The compressions should be at a rate of at least 100 per minute, but no more than 120 per minute. Place the heel of one hand on the center of the child's chest with your other hand on top. Alternatively, for a small child, you can use a one-handed compression technique. Place the heel of one hand in the center of the child's chest. Keeping your arms straight, push down about two inches and let the chest fully recoil between compressions. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve and thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 26, 27, 28, 29. Performing CPR for infants is similar to performing CPR for adults and children, but it is modified slightly due to an infant's smaller size and anatomical differences. Five, six, seven. First, Practice giving effective chest compressions. Place the palm of one hand on the infant's forehead to maintain an open airway in the neutral position. Place two fingers of your other hand on the center of the infant's chest, just below the nipple line. Press down on the chest about one and a half inches deep. Compress at a rate of at least 100 compressions per minute, but no more than 120 compressions per minute. Clear communication is vital when two rescuers perform CPR together, especially when changing positions. If the victim has no pulse, the rescuing lifeguard begins CPR starting with 30 chest compressions. As the rescuing lifeguard gives compressions, the assisting responder waits in position to provide ventilations. Counting out loud helps rescuers work together more effectively. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. After 30 chest compressions, the assisting responder gives two ventilations. The rescuing lifeguard then continues CPR with compressions. 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Both rescuers continue in these positions, one giving compressions and the other giving ventilations. To reduce fatigue, rescuers should change positions at least every two minutes or when the AED is analyzing. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. After two minutes, or approximately five cycles of CPR, the rescuers change positions. And two and three and four and five and six and Changing positions should take less than five seconds. The rescuing lifeguard calls for a change on the 30th compression and moves to the victim's head. The assisting responder locates the correct hand position on the chest and begins compressions. One and 
Now, watch the change again. The assisting lifeguard should anticipate a change is coming. Here, the rescuing lifeguard calls for a change on the 30th compression. They move quickly with their own resuscitation mask from the victim's chest to his head. When performing two rescuer CPR on a child, there is one critical difference in the CPR cycle. Instead of two ventilations to 30 chest compressions, give two ventilations for every 15 chest compressions. The rescuer who is giving compressions calls change in place of 15 at the end of the last cycle. Two rescuers can perform CPR for an infant, but the technique is slightly different than it is for adults and children. To perform CPR for an infant, the rescuer giving compressions uses the encircling thumbs technique. To provide compressions using this technique, place both thumbs side by side on the center of the infant's chest, just below the nipple line. The rescuer's other fingers should encircle the infant's chest towards the back, providing support. Using both thumbs together, Press the chest about one and a half inches at a rate of at least 100 compressions per minute, but no more than 120 compressions per minute. Let the chest fully recoil after each compression. Do not compress or squeeze the ribs at the sides. The rescuing lifeguard maintains the airway with the pediatric resuscitation mask in place and gives two ventilations. A towel or padding can be placed under the infant's shoulders to help keep the head in a neutral position. When the two rescuers are performing CPR for an infant, the cycle is 15 chest compressions followed by two ventilations. Continue cycles of 15 chest compressions and two ventilations. Switch positions about every two minutes. The assisting responder calls for a position change by using the word change in place of 15 in the compression cycle. As with any victim in cardiac arrest, if you see an obvious sign of life, stop CPR and monitor the infant's condition. Following the links of the cardiac chain of survival can help save lives. The sooner 911 is called, the sooner more advanced medical care will arrive. If a victim is not breathing and has no pulse, use an AED as soon as one is available. Because AED models function differently, follow local protocols and the manufacturer's instructions. Turn on the AED and follow the audible and visual prompts. Some turn on automatically as soon as the case is opened. The victim should be on a firm, flat surface. Quickly expose their chest and wipe it dry if necessary. Remember to remove any medication patches with a gloved hand and wipe away any remaining medication residue. Place one pad on the upper right side of the chest and the other pad on the left side of the chest. Plug in the connector to the AED if necessary. Push the Analyze button if necessary and let the AED analyze, analyze the heart rhythm. Everyone stand clear. clear. Ensure that no one is touching the victim during the analysis. If a shock is advised, Charging. make sure no one, including everyone you, is touching clear. the victim. Clear. Say, everyone clear and ensure that no rescuers or bystanders are touching the victim. Deliver the shock by pushing the shock button if necessary. After delivering the shock, immediately begin CPR, starting with chest compressions. After a shock is delivered, or if no shock is indicated, perform about two minutes of CPR before the AED reanalyzes. If at any time you notice an obvious sign of life, such as normal breathing or victim movement, stop CPR and monitor the victim's condition. For a small child, use pediatric AED pads if available. If the pads risk touching each other, place one pad in the middle of the child's chest and the other pad on the child's back, between the shoulder blades. For an infant, you should always place one pad on the chest and the other on the back. If a victim is not breathing and has no pulse, perform CPR until an AED is ready to analyze the heart rhythm. One rescuer continues CPR while the other attaches the AED pads and operates the AED. 
Attach pads firmly to person's chest, as shown. Analyzing rhythm. Everyone stand clear. Shock advised. Shock advised. Charging. Everyone stand clear. Clear. Everyone stand clear. Push the shock button. Shocking. Shock delivered. Begin five cycles of CPR. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. This is an example of how CPR and AED work together in the cardiac chain of survival. If a victim who is choking becomes unresponsive, carefully lower the victim to the ground. Send someone to get an AED and summon EMS if you haven't already done so. Immediately begin CPR, starting with chest compressions. After giving compressions, open the victim's mouth and look for an object. If you see something in the mouth, remove it with a finger sweep. If you do not see the object, do not perform a blind finger sweep. If you have removed an object or you can't see an object, try giving two ventilations. Repeat this cycle. Give 30 chest compressions, check for an object, if one is seen, perform a finger sweep, and give two ventilations. Continuing cycles of 30 compressions, finger sweeping if needed, and giving two ventilations is the most effective way to provide care. Even if ventilations fail to make the chest clearly rise, compressions may help clear the airway by moving the blockage into the upper airway where it can be seen and removed. Here's what the sequence looks like for a child. And here is what the sequence looks like for an infant. And 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. A common complication of drowning includes vomiting. To clear vomit from the airway, support the victim's head and neck and roll the victim towards you onto their side to allow fluids to drain. Clear the victim's mouth using a finger sweep. If available and you are trained in its use, use a manual suctioning device. After clearing the airway, roll the victim onto their back and continue providing care for an obstructed airway, starting with compressions. In the aquatic environment, multiple lifeguards and members of the safety team often respond to an emergency. Watch these rescuers work as a team to provide care. Hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? The rescuing lifeguard arrives and performs a primary assessment. After determining that the victim does not have a pulse, they immediately begin CPR. 
The second responder arrives and gives ventilations, while the rescuing lifeguard performs chest compressions. Another responder arrives with additional equipment, including a BVM, to assist with care. Rescuers work together as a team to provide CPR and ventilations. The third rescuer prepares the BVM and attaches it to the resuscitation mask. The fourth rescuer arrives with the AED, wipes the victim's chest dry, and prepares the AED for use while the other rescuers continue CPR. When the AED is ready to begin analyzing, the compressor pauses compressions and hovers their hands over the victim's chest so they can quickly resume compressions once a shock is delivered. And two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight. Analyzing. Clear. Shock advised. Shock advised. Rescuers performing compressions and giving ventilations should change positions about every two minutes to reduce the possibility of rescuer fatigue. Shock delivered. Begin five cycles of CPR. If at any time the victim shows a sign of life, such as breathing and a pulse, the rescuers will stop CPR and monitor the victim's condition.